Do you know about this book? Well, today we're going to review this book, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life by Joshua Fields Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus. And tell you how it relates to us as a family managing and going through traumatic brain injury recovery. Is this real? Could this be a new beginning? Hi guys, it's Mish. It's Kim. From MissionKim.com, where we try to raise TBI awareness one post at a time through product reviews such as this one, life experiences, life tips. Welcome to our channel. Welcome. So how did we come across this book? I was watching Netflix one day and I scrolled across and saw their documentary. It talked about things such as letting go and, and being genuine with yourself. And it's not just about, you know, the material things, you know, minimizing material things, but it's just things in your life that could be weighing and bringing you down. I loved it so much that I couldn't wait when, for Kim to come home for me to tell him about it. When I told him about it, I was like, I have to get this book. This book seems like it's an amazing thing. So I went on Amazon and I got it. I ingested it. As soon as she read the book, I, I grabbed it and started reading it myself. It's one of those books you kind of read a one section, a chapter at a time and kind of digest it then go back and, and read the next chapter. So the book is not necessarily a how-to for living a minimal life. It's more or less a philosophical approach on how to live a minimal life, which basically leads to a life of meaningfulness, which then, because we know that's pretty much relative, like what's meaningful to me versus what's meaningful to you, that could potentially lead, if you live a meaningful life, to happiness. So in a sense, if you sum it all up in a big bubble, it's really just saying living in the moment, living purposefully. The book starts off with discussing how they became the minimalists through their journey of being in corporate America and trying to understand if they were truly happy or not, if they thought that they were living a meaningful life. It gave the base plot, if you will, of how they got to the point of becoming the minimalists. They talked about things such as anchors, which is basically a label of those things that kept them from leading a meaningful life. And they talked about possessions and how we are more than our possessions. And that basically the point of minimalism is to give you back your freedom. Freedom of things like guilt, fear, depression, anxiety. It's not just getting rid of things. It's, it's bigger than that. It's really just kind of getting back to basics, which that whole idea for me was speaking to my heart. I, I needed to get back to basics. We needed to figure out living with recovery for traumatic brain injury, how do we get back to basics? How do we uncomplicate our lives? It led into the book covering five values that they believe to be major components or values towards leading a meaningful life. Health, relationships would be another, passions would be another, growth, and then the fifth one is contribution. The first value, which is health, was probably telling me something that I already knew, but in a different way to help me understand more what I already knew, which would be that your body is your temple. Your body isn't the destination, right? Meaning it's not the goal. It's, it's the vehicle that takes you on the journey to that goal. We get very caught up in general thinking about what our goals are, we should always have goals, that's for sure. But I think we also forget about that journey to get to that goal, which is probably 10 times more important. You won't get to the goal unless you, you take care of that journey. It's a constant care and a constant management of yourself so that you can handle the journey of getting to your goal. Everything else, in essence, is basically a bonus. The fact that they talk about how constant care is key, uh, that speaks volumes, I think, for us as a family going through traumatic brain injury recovery because that is our life every day. We're talking about constant management. We have to live in the moment. We have to really determine, you know, what can we do today to help us decide what's going to happen in the future and what can we learn from in our past to help us decide what we're doing today. And it's also not just physical, but it's also from a mental standpoint. You have to know what you have and don't have control over. At that point, you're able to manifest your hopes and your desires. The key though first is, one, understanding that your body is a vehicle to help you get to your destination. It isn't the destination. And know what you have control over and what you don't. This value is the most important for me at this point in time, you know, trying to deal with my symptoms, trying to get my body to a level of quality so I can live a 
a great and meaningful life and, and live it well with my family and my, my loved ones. This one's the, uh, this one spoke to me uh, pretty big. Relationships is the next value. And by the way, they say all the values are equally important. First off, the past does not equal the future. Basically, it's saying, let go. I think the analogy that they talked about was very succinct. Living in the past is similar to driving a car by looking only in the rearview mirror. Eventually, you're going to crash. You need to be able to see what's ahead of you. There is a point in time where the past exists for you to learn from it, but there will be a, a point in time where you have to learn to let go in kindness and move on. Another topic that they talk about is where does your attention lie? Your focus really should be on your most important people in your life, the people that are in your top tier. However, most people don't realize it, they're actually putting a lot of attention to the people that are least important to them. By example they give is work. We spend a majority of our day in the office, at work, with people sure we care about, but they're not necessarily our top tier people. And we end up seeing those people way more than the people that we see at home, which is our family. That is a fact, and maybe it should change. The only person you can change is yourself. You can't change other people. And that's another item that was discussed under the relationships value. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's not looking in the past, but looking forward kind of accepting the fact that I'm not the same person I am anymore and accepting the new me and moving forward. The other item under relationships that really spoke to me, I would say, was the idea of authenticity. None of us are perfect, but we all have the ability, we all possess the ability to be authentic and that we should be able to, to display who we are, be who we are without apology. You're on this journey to try and discover what you need to be able to tackle this thing called life and you shouldn't have to apologize for it. Be who you are. Keep it real. Keep it real. The next value um, and chapter of the book they talk about is passions. We're talking about just your heart's desire, right? right? What people tend to do and you don't realize it is when you are meeting people for the first time, an introduction, I think it's out of habit. I don't know if as a society yeah. we just learned to do this, but what is the first thing you say when you meet somebody? You kind of say, hi, I'm Mish, nice to meet you. What do you do for a living? <laughs> now, why do we do that? What, what does that tell you about me that, okay, I am a PM, I work for IT and I'm a project manager. How does that tell you what kind of person I am? The book kind of goes into that a little bit more deeply to try and tell you you're more than just your career. Your career is not the only thing that identifies you. And next time, maybe instead of asking somebody uh, what they do for a living, ask them what their, pa their passions are. That's what they say in the book. Ask that question instead. That would actually start better conversation. Right. You know, yeah. what, what kind of things are you yeah. passionate about? I tried that once and I was like, ooh, okay. Oh, how'd it go? Uh, he, he loves badminton. I was like, awesome. <laughs> that's, that's, that's close the, to tennis. That's I love tennis. <laughs> that's a neat conversation. Yeah. Versus saying, I'm a subcontractor. Yeah. Oh, that's great. The book clearly states that you deserve to live your passion. You deserve to live your mission. You deserve to live a meaningful life. The fourth value towards a meaningful life in this book is growth. The goal is continuous improvement. You're constantly trying to improve yourself. Mm -hmm. I quote from the book, if you're not growing, you're dying. And if you are dying, you're not leading a meaningful life. But the key component to growth would be raising that bar a little bit each time to make it just a little bit more difficult. So in the end, you have gone through this improvement beyond your wildest dreams. How that relates to us from a traumatic brain injury standpoint is basically how we manage every day. Yeah. He would push himself just a little bit and he may regress a little bit, but pushes himself a little bit more and over time, he's able to show the amount of improvement that he's had over the past five years. But as a traumatic brain injury survivor, the goal is always to get better and grow and get stronger. You know, that's that's my goal. It, it's taking a while. You just gotta be, you gotta be optimistic and, and put, the, put in the work. It, it's frustrating, but yes. And the more that you grow, the more you can help others grow, which covers the last value towards a meaningful life, which is contribution. If from your experiences and what you've gone through, if you're able to learn from yourself, get to the point where you believe you're leading a meaningful life, and then share those experiences with others so that they can also grow, right. then 
you've sort of hit the jackpot. You, you are at that point where you are probably leading a min meaningful life because you're now sharing, you're sharing what you love with the world. And it doesn't even have to be anything big, something you love or if it's just donating what you can or doing something beyond yourself. I mean, with contribution, I think of, of, of love and compassion. Trying to help others, I think with this channel, that's what we're trying to do. Trying to get the word out there, trying to get traumatic brain injury awareness out there. So if it can help somebody, anybody, if we can get the word out that you are not alone and that um, there is there is hope out there, um, it, it's, it fills the heart, you know, and that, that's what it's all about, helping others. Yeah, if you're able to share something with somebody and, and change their lives, um, that's major. Now you may be asking, okay, where is the minimalist part of this or where's the minimalism after we talked about all this philosophical um, gobbledygook. I think the goal in the book is to get you to understand that minimalism is a tool to help you get to this point of living a meaningful life. It's decluttering not only your physical possessions right. but decluttering your relationships, uh, decluttering your mind, which is very important for us. We know that from a brain perspective that decluttering is key towards his recovery. We try to let go of many of our possessions. We donate on a regular. It helps with taxes, <laughs> for one. Two, it's, it's less for our brains to think about. I don't think that there is a, quite a black and white description to what you need to get rid of to be considered living a minimal life. Yeah. The book even mentions that. They talk about how it is relative to the person. Do you need 500 pairs of shoes? Do you need some people if they're <laughs> passionate about it? For us, a cluttered environment is a cluttered mind. Mm -hmm. And the more non-cluttered, more clean and simple we live, the more clean and simple our minds are. It's tough with a kid, I'm not gonna lie. I swear I'll clear out a place in the living room, feel really proud and good about myself, and the next second she sees it and figures that it's a great place to scatter all of her tiny toys about. <laughs> and then relationships, when you're decluttering your relationships, it's focusing on those relationships that are super important to you, that deserve your full attention. Right. And then with passions would be getting rid of the things that are keeping you from it. It's not just material things, it can right. be anything. Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah. All in all, I, I thought it was a great book. I love the book. Yeah. It spoke to me. <laughs> we love the book. I might read it again. It sort of was like a catalyst for me to begin you know, thinking about our future journey. Um, it's not a long book. You could see that it's, it's actually very thin and small. Joshua Fields Milburn and Ryan and Nicodemus do a great job in putting together the topic succinctly. And again, I gotta remind you, it is not a how-to. Very philosophical, it's sort of like why you would go about doing it. Yes, I recommend it. Go out and get it. And check out the, uh, check out the uh, documentary on Netflix. Question of the day, what, what are your passions? What are your passions? Yeah. What are your passions? Um, this. This is my passion. Yay. My family. Yes. Eating ice cream, eating Ooh. pizza, eating food. Eating food. Hi, I'm Mish, and I love to eat food. <laughs> That's what I would say to people. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to know what your passions are. Leave them in the comment section below. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please subscribe if you have not. Please like the video, and we'll uh, see you at the next video, man. Peace. That equals that. <laughs> yeah, but let us know if you... <clears throat> but let... <laughs> the book starts off with how... Who did <laughs> what is love? What is loving? What is learn? What is learning? What is higher? Back to minimal.